And I think we're live, Aaron. I'm just waiting for the live. echo to start. I've got to turn off immediately my other um, browsers because they always are on because I'm always watching YouTube on there, but I'm waiting for them to update. Hang on, here comes one now. There we go. I've got one off there. <laughs> Wait for the echo. Here they come in. Oh, no. Oh, no. Let me just check this one because I think this is going to do it too. Is it? No, it's not. I'm right. I turned it off really quickly. Hey, man. How you doing? <laughs> are, you, are your echoes gone? Yeah, they're fine I don't now. Hear none from me. No, nah, we're right. We, we're cooking, Aaron. How have you been? Okay, I'm doing really good. It's been super hot here. I'm very jealous of you because I know when it's super hot here over there, and Australia, it's a little cooler. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah, it's uh, quite cold today. Well, when I say cold, I think it's going to be a top of, what, 16, I think. I'll Celsius. Take it. I don't know what that is. It's probably 65 or 68 or something. I don't know. Ah, that sounds nice. Here <laughs> it's I have got, something. I have got a mug of Milo here, Aaron. Look at this. We've got the same mugs. Oh, that's super weird. How'd that happen? <laughs> it's exactly the same. Oh, my gosh. Mine's blurry, mm. though. <laughs> I, I, you got Milo. I've got ginger tea, freshly made by my wife. So who's here? Let's see at this stage. Sizzle Man, and we, obviously people are going to start coming in now. So uh, Sizzle Man is here. Um, hey, Kevin, how are you, buddy? Uh, we got, uh Rick's also here saying howdy. Well, that's a nice little, uh, what do you call it? Is it a, not a Segway? What do you call those cars? Moke? <laughs> I think we call them Mokes here. Uh, in his profile, I think yeah, it's I'm a not sure. Yeah, it's a sort of a, a little beachy type car that he's got there. How about a dune buggy? Uh, yeah, hi from Southern Ontario. Is it Ontario? Ontario. On Ontario. Ontario. New Jersey's in the house. George, Mark. George is also here. Mark? Um, Mark is here as well. G'day, Mark. How you going? Rick says uh, it's called a mini moke. Oh, mini moke. So it was a moke. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I never there even heard go. of a moke. <laughs> You learn something every day. Hey, Brett. Uh, Brett's here as well. How you going, Brett? Uh, a couple of fellow Brisbaneites. Um, they're also, uh, I noticed they were whinging up there. It was quite funny. They were whinging up in Brisbane because uh, it's cold. And I think it was because uh, it, it was about <laughs> six degrees Celsius. <laughs> it's like the end of the world up there for them. <laughs> Man, it's like a hundred and something here. The Sahara Desert blowing in sand from you know, far off and our skies look like Southern California right now, which means very brown. <laughs> oh, so how long does that last? Uh, I don't know. I would say a couple of weeks every year, but it's like really bad. I've never seen it be this bad in 12 years. It's like really bad. My eyes are itchy and yeah. Not good. Um, G is uh, from New Zealand. Oh, I love New Zealand. We, I've got to come back there again soon. I want to go. Yeah, one of my favorite places on earth. Absolutely adore New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, can't wait to get back there. It looks like New Zealand is going to be one of the first places to open up for travel for Australians. They're going to do what they call a travel bubble, which means because Australia has so low um, virus counts, they're going to do a... Um, international travel between the two of us. I mean, not in a lot of ways, Australia and New Zealand are almost the same country anyway. Um, we don't need visas to get in and all this sort of stuff. And, we, you know, we, we treated like we um, are locals when we go in, like we can work over there, they can work over here and things like that. So it looks like that's going to be the first place we're going to travel to. So that might be somewhere where I go because I'm going to be able to go there um, be reasonably soon. Uh, Michelle's here as well. G'day, Michelle. Carol. How are you? Um, she's saying hi, Aaron and David. Uh, Brett's saying good morning, guys. We're just giving it a few minutes, uh, everyone, just to let people in before we uh, start, you know, going on with the show. You know, Dave, every time I do the show, I feel like it's my first time because yeah, I'm, like, <laughs> trying to figure out an organization and what do I click on next. Yeah, Brett's cold uh, up there. Um, Carol, g'day, Carol. Good to see you in here as well. Um, what's what's Brett said there? I mean, Brett hey, said Dana. I'm a summer guy, David. <laughs> I don't I'm, quite like winter. Oh, I love winter. That's like my, I hate summer and I just love winter. I've always been like a mountain man. I grew up in the mountains, mm. uh, mountains in the woods. Mm. And uh, I just love chilly weather and I love to put on coats and all that stuff. Uh, the heat, I just, uh, I don't like it. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, you never get winter up there. <laughs> mm -mm. I mean, I like, the funny Never. thing is I actually like the, I do, I do like summer as well, but I also like the seasons because I love the, the changing like the seasons. seasons. Yeah, yeah. And I like the fact that, like you said, I can sit in front of a fire and rug up and I love yeah, going yeah. out in the morning where it's frosty and misty and foggy. And, you know, I love that sort of 
um, atmosphere. Like, you know, New York uh, Central Park in winter, you know, where the snow is oh, everywhere. Man. Oh, you know, yeah. You saw my photos there. I mean, yes. that was that was my bucket list to uh, get Liz Deanne out there and take photos in that, that type of environment. Oh, my gosh. That was like one of my highlights. But like you said, I do like, uh, you know, maybe I would get, I came from Ohio, so it was like really cold, but it would get hot in the summer. So, you know, I mean, you might get sick of it if it's just always cold. So, yeah, I do like the um, the seasons, that's for sure. Um, great, uh, great diving in New Zealand as well, but the water is cold. Yeah, Tasmania sort of down here is very, very similar as well. Here um, it's really warm and crystal clear water. Carl is saying hello, David, Aaron, and friends. Uh, Dana's here as well, saying hi all. Um, Mark said, he, 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 once you get acclimatized, it becomes cold up here. Melbourne is mostly miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I know Mark always goes on about that. I love Melbourne, it's though. I, I absolutely adore Melbourne. I think it's it's got the best sort of cafe culture and sports. I just love it, yeah. Oh, I would love that. Um, um, Hogarth, I am here in Puerto Rico. Been here about 12 <laughs> years. Travel a lot. You never know where I'll pop up. But right now, I for 12 years, I've lived here, and that's where I'm at, like, right now. Now, minus 25 is, says not yeah, fun. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's getting a little extreme. Aaron's a Puerto Rico. Yeah. So Aaron's, uh, yeah, in an island, a tropical paradise, basically. So he never, ever sees, um, he never, ever sees winter. <laughs> never. Unless I, we travel a lot. So I get to see it through my travels. So George said, my wife found my new Tamron 28 to 200 millimeter. I blamed it on David. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> now she wants to have a chat with Kerry. Oh, George, don't start. Oh, that's oh my funny. God. <laughs> that's funny. Well, I certainly won't be buying anything for a while, not until uh, work starts picking up, that's for sure. So I'm just staying with what I've got. And in a way, it's it's been quite good because it's made me realise that exactly. I, I can get by with what I have. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it, it changes your whole thinking. Like normally I'd have all this time where everything has been released and out and I'd be wanting to buy more and more and more. And lately I've just been thinking, well, <laughs> I don't really need much else. Exactly. That's, so, that's, that's the bottom line. I just wanted to start the show today, too, to talk about a great video Aaron put up on his channel. Um, I watched it this oh, morning. I think it went up. I'm not sure whether it went up overnight. But yeah, in the morning. This, yeah, oh. it was there this morning when I got up. Um, tell us a little bit about it, Aaron, because I know you're just starting in your channel, having the uh, you've gone more towards the art side of things. But uh, tell us a little bit about that video, because I'd love people to, after they finish with this show to go over and have a look. Well, yeah, that's the thing, you know, uh, being in the quarantine, like most of my photography is or videography was always shooting people or video uh, filming people. It's one or the other. Uh, I did, you know, dabble in filming just uh, just still life or things or sceneries or whatever like that but predominantly it's been photographing or doing video of people and you know during the quarantine uh, i didn't have a model to shoot you know my wife models for me all the time but just in the scenario we couldn't go out and all this stuff so it was kind of like what do i do and i would never oh i would very rarely take a photo of just stuff in the last uh, i don't know 12 years or whatever uh, because there's not a model there or someone to model for me so during my wife said why don't you just start taking photos of things and posting that on instagram so you know you just your your instagram just doesn't die out and all that stuff so i said yeah i should start just taking photos of stuff looking at something interesting and photographing it in a way that you commonly don't see it you know like most people stand it about uh, depending on how tall you are but mm -hmm. they stand upright and they look at the world like this with a 50 millimeter ish uh, compression and i don't know uh, the field of view but like that so if you look at a scene, you go, this looks pretty cool. Where's the light coming in? Where's the lines? And start thinking about, like, this is there's something cool here, but how can I make it just put something to it, to put, to put some sauce to it? So I really started digging into what I used to do before I was doing professional type stuff 12 years ago. And that is just looking at things and finding out how you can uh, lead someone's eye around the photo and lead it to where getting into photography, basically, and the art of it. And then I started looking at the, the history of it as well in these last uh, month or so. And so I decided like, you know what, I, I'm just, I don't want to do gear videos. I, I want to get more into the art and the history, the history of mm. photography. So I said, you know what, I think I'm just going to start a new YouTube channel because it's just uh, that one has become a mess and I just want to be more in the art of photography. So I made a new YouTube channel, uh, Aaron Janerson photographer. And uh, my first video was basically, 
talking about kind of that, uh, basically talking that I think we should get more back to the art of photography and not the gear for photography, because I think it's been a stumbling, uh, a stumbling block and a trap for new photographers that come in. They immediately go to YouTube to learn photography and then they just get swept away in gear videos. And that's that they just, I mean, I know people that just watch gear videos over and over and they're always buying gear and they like, Hey, you, mm. I don't see your work or you didn't take a photo or a video as the, yeah, but that new, it's just, I just seen this like, wow, I just don't want to be a part of that anymore. So I decided to make a channel that's going to highlight on techniques, history. I'm going to call out other photographers who inspire me and things like that. So if you want, check it out. Um, I wish I could put the link here in the chat, but uh, I, I'm sure I'll I don't want it. to screw I'll, I'll stick it under the uh, description down the bottom here anyway, so people can go and check that um, out. So you, we can, you know, they can well, go and have a look. that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was good. Now, I noticed too, uh, have you, uh, are you still shooting Sony at all, or have you now gone completely back to Yeah, I've got Sony Fuji. and Fuji. I, I got someone again was gracious and got a <laughs> got another fuji on my hand so i've been doing both but you know i i just i end up picking up the fuji more uh i don't know why it's just one so of those which one things are you using what are you using it's just now? an which older one? one it's the xt2 oh, okay it's an older one i think it's like four years old now but like we were saying um man you really i've said this kind of over the years it's really it's I, if you watch my video there's tons of uh uh, famous photographer quotes in there about saying it's really has nothing to do with the gear and other people would say you know you, you give a professional a, a crappy camera and they're going to make a really cool photo mm. uh, if you give a, a brand new a brand new photographer the best camera with all the features it might be a crappy photo so it really doesn't matter so I really finally said okay that's it uh, I'm done uh, this camera will do me good for many years I yep. even said that when I first started YouTube I had to uh the Canon uh, T, T2i, which is a long time ago, and I could use that camera today with a nice lens on it, mm. and nobody would ever question my photography. They just wouldn't. So, yeah, that's why yeah. I'm picking up the X, the old X-T2 most of the time. I mean, it is. It's at the, the end of the day, if, if you're an artist and you have an eye, uh, you yep. get far more work than if you have really good gear and you haven't got yeah. an eye. Yeah, I mean, it's and just, hey, that's it's it. the way that's it is. It. Unfortunately, most of us upgrade our, our camera gear particularly before we've even mastered the gear exactly. that we've already got you know and that's the interesting thing about it and I, I think that's one of the bad things about what we do because if you look at even what i use which is the a9 and the a7 III, you know i mean they're incredible cameras and i probably only use 10 right. probably 20 percent of what those cameras can possibly do right. um they're amazing, and you know, I I'm, I also want to get back more to, to the art side of things because I love that, and that's probably another thing that I really want to uh, concentrate on, and well, particularly the video side of things. I'm really starting to love that, you know, the yeah. artistic side in that. Well, I hope that video I did inspires people to get back into the 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 art and maybe even the history because history will teach you so much about the art itself. So hopefully that inspires people to move. And the thing about you know, like you're saying, you know, buying that next camera before you master the old one. I mean, think about this, you, you know, you, you hear of a, a new camera model coming out. So what do you do? You, you look at countless videos. You probably spend days, if not weeks, looking at these videos. Then you probably buy it. And now you got to watch countless videos of how to learn it or your yeah. nose in the manual or fumbling around or around the house, taking photos of flowers, trying to learn. You're wasting so much time away from taking something that uh, going out and thinking about the art of it with the camera that you've already mastered like two years ago and coming up with stuff like, wow, that's a really cool photo. Mm. Now, I'll show some photos and it'll just kind of go over people's heads, not to say like I'm this master and people's not seeing it, but there's some things in some of the photos I take that are like, oh, you know what? I remember reading a book about this and then I would be, you know, sizing it up and like, oh man, I captured it. But people would just go, oh, cool. And they they don't realize that it was like a really cool like, why does that photo work? Maybe I'll do some videos on why this photo works or something, because some people don't see it because they don't know the art and all that weird stuff and uh, technical things about photography. Most people put a pretty model up there. Uh, they put a, a flashlight up. They blur the background. They take a photo, which completely is art in itself. But that there's like so much more to photography than just that, which is kind of the predominant thing you see on YouTube is shooting models or posing a model. Mm. There's just so much more, even using a model. Um, 
my friend Benjamin Canerick, man, he he has he does just that. He'll take beautiful models. Uh, he shoots for Vogue magazine and other magazines. And he'll man, his compositions are really like, whoa. This one photo he posted the other day was, um, I was like, where's the model at? Oh, there she is. She, she was like buried <laughs> in this just completely busyness, but it was just so artistic and cool. So there's so much more than just shooting a pretty face with a blurred out background is basically what I'm saying. Well, when you go and watch the video uh, later, obviously not now, but when you go and watch yeah, the video after now. you've seen this, just check out some of the comments that, uh, you know, the masters and things like that have put in, which makes the it quotes, really yeah. relevant. It's very, very interesting. Aaron has got some uh, sort of comments that he's posted in between uh, his sort of discussion, and, and it's really good. All right, well, yeah. let's get started anyway, because um, I wanted to go through. Now, our first story today is actually talking about using S-Log, HLG, or the uh, standard picture profile when you're shooting video. Um, and I wanted to test this out because uh, yesterday I, um, or sorry, the other day, I think it was um, Saturday, no, Friday, when I went to do the review of the Tamron 28 uh, to 200 millimeter, I decided that I'd shoot HLG3, um, basically for the first time really that I've shot with that. And I thought that I'd do it to test how it went, uh, you know, with uh, and sort of how it would work, how the whole system functioned. Um, how it was working in editing and things like that. And it was really interesting because um, I'm not sure it's really, and this is going to be the interesting thing, and I'd love people down below too to comment and even in the live chat maybe want to comment too. I fully understand if you're talking about a very contrasty dynamic uh, range shot where it's very, very bright sunlight and, and extreme shadows that it, you probably definitely do get a benefit from sh shooting HLG or S-Log. And HLG, I suppose if you have a um, HLG monitor, like I believe YouTube actually will let oh, yeah. you view HLG now as well, yeah. um, you will get much nicer colours and things like that. But I'm just wondering whether it's actually worth the hassle and the effort compared to shooting the standard profile. Now, Aaron, the interesting thing is I saw, and I would have loved to have saved it, but I saw an article uh, the other day on Facebook. It was a photographer. She was a wedding photographer. No, sorry, she was a wedding videographer. Mm -hmm. And she said, and she had lovely, beautiful work, and, and she posted uh, a, a post to say, the first time this weekend... I didn't shoot with S-Log. I, oh. I shot with the standard profile and it was a complete rev re uh, re uh, yeah, re revelation. revelation. Yeah, revelation. <laughs> it was a complete revelation. Yeah. Uh, it was that easy to do. And she actually said, and this is the thing that I thought, wow, I might talk about this with Aaron on the, the chat, that she thinks her images look nicer with the standard profile and anything that she'd produced before with uh, S-Log or anything else she'd used. I got a comment on that. I mean, it's 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 interesting. Now, I'm going to show in a minute how the whole process works with, say, HLG. And I'll also show, like, something I've grabbed before um, without the profile. Now, the interesting thing cool. is that when I've shot videos before, everyone... And I mean, I get this every single time I post videos, people say to me, what picture profile did you use? Because they think I've used a picture profile. Now, let me just show you one. I mean, I'm just gonna open up one uh, here. Uh, let me just open up this. Um, open. How do I make your video bigger for me? Oh, there it goes. Uh, oops, not that one. I don't want it to come out on sound soap. No. <laughs> To quit yet? Let me open it up and quit. Yeah, Mark. In that video, I do say, you know, you know, uh, uh, tech is important, but it's not everything. I just saw your comment there. All right. So Wait, let me David. just sh share this. Uh, let me share this screen. And let me go application window and this. I mean, some of you have seen this before, but it's just a perfect example about me using something. And I'll talk about that once we play it. Oh, cool! I can see it really good right here.
All right, so let me just stop uh, the screen sharing there for a second. Now, that was shot with the standard profile. I think that was shot with the A9, actually. But now, like I said, every single time that I shoot video, I get the same comments of people saying, what picture profile did you use? And they're quite shocked when I say I didn't use one. It was a standard profile. So the, the beauty of this is that I didn't have to really touch that at all because I'd exposed it correctly in the camera. Um, and therefore, when I took it into Final Cut, all I had to do was very, very minimal editing on that to get that to look like it was there. And I think that looks beautiful. And it's it completely standard. There's nothing on there at all that, that caused editing issues or anything else. Um, and I'm going to show in a minute uh, what you have to do for, say, using HLG. Yeah, did you want to say anything about that, Aaron, before I show that? or is there No, anything... keep going. I'll do my okay. comments when you're done. All right. So that, that's that side of it. So that's sort of showing um, how you do that. So all I really did was just bring that straight into Final Cut. Now, let me just show you another one that I did here, which is this is also – well, let me open it up first. Um, let me scroll down here. Now, this was shot uh, in 4K. Um, let me just go share screen and application window and again i'll bring it up now if i play this one now you're not going to see much movement here because this was just a test just to get this uh, the exposure and everything correct with uh, renee so this as you can see it's it, there's only a little bit of movement that you can see uh, going on here this again was shot with the standard profile now the reason why it was shot with the standard profile i i, I intended to do hlg for the whole day but i saw this scene and I didn't have time to get my A73 out which was set up to HLG3 so I grabbed my A9. You so didn't this have was time because the light would have left? Yeah, yeah, the light only lasted a few minutes. Mm. So I ended up shooting this whole scene and I did some dance uh, scenes with Renee there that um, uh, I just set the camera up. A9 doesn't have picture profiles at all so all I did was set it up, adjust the exposure correctly and I got this in standard profile, this has had no editing. This, this is exactly as the footage came out um, on that. So it's raw. You're looking at the raw footage here. Uh, and if, if you could see the real footage, like not this compression footage that you're looking at through YouTube, the, the footage is stunning, actually. And this is completely done uh, through the standard profile. So again, no editing needed. I could just get what I wanted, put it in, and it would be out straight away. Now, what I wanted to do with the other part was I thought, well, I'm going to do... Um, uh, HLG. So what I did was let me just open up this and I'll show you the process about how you capture HLG footage. So let me just open this up. And again, I'll share the screen. So now this one is, is the whole process of how you use HLG. So you'll hear me talking anyway through it. We don't hear any audio. Oh, is there no audio? No. Oh, that's because I'm using that mix minus. Let me put mix minus off just for a second and it should work. Oh, hang on. Um, just don't talk, Aaron, because I think you'll echo back, but we'll just see. Uh, advanced audio operations. I've got to find where I turn it off now. Oh, yeah, there it is. Now, it should work now, I hope. Okay, so what I thought I'd do, I thought that Can I'd you show it? you uh, how to edit HLG3 um, files, just show you how the system works. So what I've done is, uh, this is a review I'm doing of the Tamron 28 to 200 uh, that's happening at the moment. So I thought I'd show you here uh, what's going on. So this is the clip that I'm adding up. Now, if I click on the clip uh, and I press on the information up over here, um, you'll see that this is a, it's a 4K file and it's shot in 25p. And you can see too that it is showing that it's Rec 2020 and it's HLG. In fact, it was shot uh, HLG3. Um, this was in the, we're using the Sony A7 III. Um, now you'll notice too that when I put it into uh, the timeline down the bottom, uh, look how much this is overexposed. So if you're looking over here, you can see how much this is overexposed at the moment. This is the difference, say, between using a standard profile and something which is HLG. 
Um, so what I thought that I'd do now is I'll show you how you can correct this. Now I'm going to use something that's called Leaming LUTs. I could edit this manually if I wanted to, uh, but there's a lot more that's involved in it. And I, I use what they call uh, a Leaming LUTs. Uh, what happens here is I've set up the zebras. Once the zebras disappear, I know that the exposure is basically set uh, correctly. Uh, and then all I do is I bring this into the timeline. Now at the moment, if you look over on the right hand side over here, there's an area here that shows uh, camera LUT. Now at the moment it's got none on there. Uh, but if I click inside here, I can go down to the bottom down here and there's multiple different LUTs that are showed through through this. Like there's actually sign uh, two, there's neutral, um, there's HLG, HLG three, log, um, S log two and S log three. Um, but I'm going to choose a HLG3. Now I'll just turn this off so you can see it. So watch what happens to the image when I press this HLG3. Uh, you can see now immediately that it, it darkens up. So it's brought all of those ranges now into line. Now if I undo that, I'll just show you one more thing here. Um, let me just turn the LUT off again. Look over here too if you're looking at the waveform. You can see that it's way overexposed. It's actually, what, 110 uh IRE up here uh, and you can see there's just no shadows down the bottom like it, th this is basically what that exposure has done okay so now watch what happens when I put the LUT on so I'm going to come down to HLG3 and now also look at the waveform as well you can see here now it's brought it with completely within the range uh, so nothing is clipped uh, and it's much more balanced now you can see it's darker though that's the only thing now all I have to do now is a little bit of adjustment so if I go into my color controls for this um, let me just click on the image and I'm going to adjust this. Now all I do is I just manipulate this to where I like the look of what's going on. So I'm going to adjust the highlights. I'm going to adjust the midtones up a little bit. I'm going to then drag the shadows down, checking the waveform over here in each case. And now you can see uh, that that's a fairly nice exposure. And again, if I wanted to, you know, you can just play around with this until you get the look that you like. Uh, in the image, just making sure that you're not clipping things in the waveform, etc., uh, over there as well. So it, you know, it's a great way of working, and it's basically all automated uh, to give you a great result without much uh, manipulation or editing at all. Okay, so <clears throat> oh, let me just put that back on. Um, and that that's that's the difference. Uh, you know what? I really wish that I'd done is taken the same shot with HLG on, uh, HLG3 on, and then just turn the picture profile off and seeing how much I can match them in post. Now I know, I know there's more dynamic range, but there's just something that I love about the standard profile. And that's what that girl and I, like I said I wish I'd grab that that's what that girl said when she was or that woman said uh, on Facebook when she'd shot the standard profile for the first time and it was like this wow what have I been doing all this time by using picture profiles and everything else she said her colors were the nicest that she'd seen I, I think that the Sony and it's probably the same in other formats I can't talk about it because I haven't shot those like Fuji and other things but you may be able to talk about that Aaron in a minute but I think that for me personally, I just think I'm going to stick with the standard profile now. I think the standard profile is the most underrated profile that's out there. The other issue is too, and I worked this out when I was shooting the other day as well, that your picture profiles are baked into the JPEG file. So if something happened to your meet your card, uh, you'll get HLG3 files on your JPEG files, which might, which will probably render those JPEGs useless. Um, so if you're doing what I do, which is, uh, you know, like fusion of a mix of video and stills at the same time, it's quite dangerous shooting an HLG3 or any other thing like S-Log or whatever. Your raw files are fine, yes, but your JPEGs may not be. Uh, and I thought, you know, I, I just wanted to know what your opinion was about that, Aaron, because I just don't know if it's worth worth the workload unless you have extremely I know and I know videographers are going to say David you're talking complete rubbish here I'm talking from my experience about doing this and I just really think 99% of the time I'm just going to shoot the standard profile after doing that test with that video yep well that goes back to the old uh, argument of doing it in post or getting it right in camera and uh, 
I would say the last uh, maybe three weeks, every photo that I had been posting on social media on our Facebook uh, page and uh, my Instagram has all been JPEG straight out of camera with the X-T2. Um, because it's that point where uh, I, I shoot raw plus JPEG. So uh, if I, you know, if there's something screwed up, which is rare, very rare, then I can use the raw file. But if I'm doing especially a wedding where you got white dresses or anything for a magazine shoot or something, of course, I'm going to shoot uh, both and probably use the raw because I'm probably going to touch those files anyways. But most of the time, if you're not shooting critical work like that professionally, uh, you got to ask yourself, uh, do you want to get it right in camera or do you want to uh, do it in post? And that's the same thing you're doing with kind of shooting HLG where you, you got to just bring it back to what standard would have gave you anyways. And I've been a big proponent uh, against shooting flat. I've said it in many of my uh, videos on YouTube and uh, here on this sh uh, show because it's like, again, when new people come to uh, YouTube to learn videography or photography, they're told these specific things that you must do. I mean, you see these videos like, um, uh, as a new photographer, you must do these five things, turn your thing off and turn mm -hmm. it down, all this thing. And so they're doing all this and they're struggling. Oh, why does my footage look like crap? And I mean, I've been on YouTube for, I don't know, eight years or nine years, maybe 10 now. And I have that question all the time. Like, why is your footage look so good? And mine doesn't look so good and all this stuff. And sure enough, they're shooting in a flat picture profile. And in order to get it to look as good as standard, you really have to know what you're doing within the specific mm -hmm. um, uh, profile that you're using. So if you're using HLG, you really need to practice on that, learn it really good and learn how to get it back to the standard. But then why, why would you want to do that? For me, there's, uh, I'd rather just get it right in camera all the time, whether I'm shooting photos or video. Uh, but because we have a raw file that gets spit to the other card, you might as well shoot raw plus JPEG type of thing in, in photography and video. You can't do that. And yeah, I mean, it's, if you just, every time I would do just like that wonderful video you did of the girl by the boat, there's complete, I mean, standard gave you, did you turn down the contrast or anything, or you just left it zero, zero, zero? No, no, no. The, the settings I used, and I wanted to talk about that. I use Leeming LUTs. Now, Leeming LUTs are amazing. Uh, I paid for them. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not like I'm sponsored by them or anything. I bought yeah. them. They give you a whole document that tells you to turn things down. Like it's, I think it was, um, I, th I think the settings are low. I'll, let me just open this up, uh, Aaron, because I can actually tell you exactly the settings. So they were Thanks turned down. Like contrast and saturation oh, were all turned down. Um, like quite dramatically, um, like like uh, sharpness was turned down to minus seven. Uh, let me just open this up and I'll tell you. Um, so let me just see, because I'll show you the settings. All right, let me just open this up and I'll show you exactly what the settings were. Now, Langston also, just before we did that too, Langston also said, David, you, you're not wrong in what you said. It's not rubbish. He said, good videographers uh, are smart enough to know when they should be using standard profile exactly. versus something specialised like S-Log because they have special needs in post. And uh, Langston, I mean, he's a great videographer. Langston said, from, from this videographer's perspective, I don't see anything wrong with what you're saying. No need to colour grade if there's no special reason. All right, let me just share this and I'll show you exactly how this was set up Aaron just so it gives you some context uh, for how this was done so Leeming Lutz <clears throat> they uh, do this for you they, they give you a guide that uh, tells you how to set everything up so if you're using neutral profile sign 2 S log 2, S log 3, HLG and HLG 3 these are the settings that, uh, that are set up actually I think that's for the um, so those are the settings that they're working off on their LUTs to, to yeah, go? Yeah, it's here actually, through. Aaron, yeah. So they're saying that your zebras have to be 100 plus for HLG3. You use PPP5 and it's HLG3. It's uh, BT2020. Your detail is minus seven. Now, the settings that they tell you before that, though, that they tell you to set something else. I can't remember what it was, but there's there's a whole stack of settings that they tell you to put in. Um, so yeah, the, the only thing Ooh. I changed in that was the detail was minus seven. Uh, so that's all I changed. I didn't change saturation. I didn't change contrast, I don't think. Uh, I'm just trying to look down here to see if they told me to change anything else. Uh, they tell you to do custom white balance, so you do custom white balance each time. So it's quite detailed in everything that they uh, tell yeah. you what to do. Um, and it works. I mean, it's 
it actually did work as I just showed you. Like all I had to do was load that LUT into Final Cut that they showed me and then it works straight away. Now I know, uh, so that's a paid LUT that you can bring in and you can even bring that LUT into Ninja Vs or anything else that you want to work with as well. Yeah. So that that's all called this. I'll just bring it up to the front page so you can see. It's just called Leaming LUT Pro uh, and they've just brought out version two. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, so you can shoot with anything. Now I know you did a video, Aaron, though, didn't you, that, that was uh, discussing uh, these settings, didn't you? Yeah, it was a video uh, trying to get it get it right in camera with having just a little bit of wiggle room because uh, unless you you unless you really unless you really like let's say you're going to do a short film and you're in a kitchen and you have this thing happening and you're bringing your lighting in to make it look a certain way and you're dialing your camera specifically with all these settings to get it to look exactly like you want in camera, which it's kind of nobody i mean i can't say nobody but many people i don't know anybody that does it like like we're going to get it 100 percent in camera it's usually getting it really close in cameras when we say that mm. so that in post all you have to do is like okay uh we we didn't because you don't want it to be so crushed where man i wish we could see that pickle jar because that pickle jar is very important to the story because let's say they're gonna you know it's like a little easter egg for something you don't want to crush that out now you can't bring it back because once you crush it in like a, a jpeg -y type uh, file structure, then you can't bring it back. So you want a little bit of wiggle room. And uh, so what I was doing is using different picture profiles to give the colors to look uh, perfectly correct to my color chart and getting it in a way to where all I have to do is tweak a little bit saturation. If the, if the scene that I like later look like, yeah, I need it a little more saturated and maybe I can make it a little more contrasty. I mean, I'm talking about just little budging things and we're done. Mm. And so that was my goal. And standard kind of does that too. Now, if I were to shoot standard, I would probably turn down the contrast a little bit. Again, I don't want nothing crushed to give me that little bit of wiggle room. And that's all you really need. So, man, yeah, it, I think in my opinion, it's a waste of time for the majority of people doing YouTube videos, short films, and, and stuff that aren't like you don't have a big production behind it and you're just kind of your own uh, – what do you call that? One man band type of guy, unless you just love this trying to get it back to what standard would have got you anyways. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, even doing all that let stuff that you're showing me, I just, I've been doing it's it long enough to where, yeah, it's, it's, like, why? <laughs> it's like, why, what, what mm -hmm. are you going to get out of it in the end? Uh, you might, you know, feel like you're more professional or if you really want to learn because you want to work for some production house as a colorist, then by all means, you got to do it to learn it. But if, you, if that's not your goal in life to w work as a colorist for a production company and you just want to make pretty videos, keep it in standard. Like right now we're watching uh, at the X-T2 in, uh, in Classic Chrome, that new video that we were talking about in the beginning that I put on my new channel. Yeah. That was all that's all done in camera. I touched not, literally touched mm. nothing uh, in that whole video because I'm using the iPad Pro now for everything I do except for this. And yeah, I'm doing it like just getting it right in camera. So to each his own, but you could save a lot of a lot of time just using a standard profile and just tweaking saturation and maybe the color uh, warmer or cooler and a little bit of contrast. You're done. So. I just find I, I just find when I'm doing it, as long as I nail and I know if I can't get it because I can see it in the screen anyway. I mean, I know yeah. when I'm looking at the image, the type of result now I'm going to get when I do it. You know, when it's outputted. But like I just showed you, the amount of work extra oh. like i said it might be if you're a full-on videographer but even langston says yeah. he uses he only uses um s log and things like that or hlg when he needs to use it and that's the thing i suppose if you reached a range where you were looking at something and you thought there's no way i can get this range that i want then it might force you that you have to use hlg but i haven't come across that yet at this stage where i think I've ruined the footage because I didn't do that. I've always been able to get it by using the standard profile with careful exposure. And yeah, you know, and it's throughout my time, I, I did ruin it, not maybe ruin, but got a little, some shots. This is a while ago. That was a little too contrasty. Like I said, I couldn't bring it back. But once after I made that mistake, then I always know if I'm trying to get it right in camera, just back off on the contrast a little bit. The color, you can keep it zero, or if you, like I said in my last video on my uh, Aaron J. Anderson photographer uh, uh, YouTube channel, I literally, it's just, I got it right in camera how I want it. And like all the photos I've been posting the last three weeks, is I, I'm getting it right in camera 100%. Uh, 
but I'm not crushing it too much. It's just whatever you like. And the other thing is it's not just trying to create or capture the most dynamic range, but if you're gonna go for a narrative film and you're really gonna color grade it to a very special color grade, like you're going, uh, I don't know, just pick any movie you like, uh, The Matrix, that's popular mm. for that green look. Then you might wanna shoot you know, with the contrast down, or, uh, saturation and all that stuff, cause you're gonna really color grade that thing like crazy. But then do you got a camera that has a big enough codec or a, a good enough megabits per second or whatever they call it, or are you shooting raw that'll allow you to really color grade it the way you think you're going to like Hollywood? Because you probably got like an A7 III that, you know, it's gonna break apart if you really push it too much anyways. So yeah, I, I'm I'm not a fan of, of flat picture profiles. Uh, and You know things. what I've found the biggest difference is white balance. This is oh, yeah, the that's thing huge. that <laughs> I have found more than anything. If if you just that's use your huge. automatic white balance, the, the color and everything can be all over the place. As long as you lock your white balance in and you do it, and I use the same thing as well. Very I just important. use the uh, Color Checker Passport video version. I use that. Do a custom white balance on that. If you can't do that, just set it as a, uh, you know, as a, a um, go like 5600 if it's daylight or whatever. Set your white balance in like that and lock it in so that you know that each shot you're going to do, it's not going to have a, sort of variations between each take that you do, which can look really bad. Uh, so, you know, try and stay out of auto white balance if you can. I found that's a far more critical thing uh, than yeah, anything. And wait. as long as I've done that, I've always been happy with the footage. And like I said, everyone has always asked me, oh, what profile did you use? And I think they're shocked when I just say it was a standard profile. Yeah, because I think people are just uh, heard those YouTube guys say, no, you got to shoot flat. And it's like, these guys are new. They don't even know how to color grade. How are you telling these people to shoot flat? They're going to have terrible time. And then they're going to come to you and ask you, hey, what picture profile you use? Because it looks amazing. I use standard. Oh, I wish someone would have told me just to use standard and drop the contrast just a little bit. And then they could have saved so much time and headaches and wonder why their footage doesn't look as good as someone else's. Uh, the color balance or white balance is the absolute most important, uh, unless you're shooting on a black magic camera or a red camera or an Arri Alexa or whatever that shoots raw or whatever, yeah. that you could change it later, like a raw photo, then you have to nail it no matter what picture profile you're using. And like David said, if you put it in auto and it's, even if your camera's locked down and you're, you're showing like a beautiful scene like he had with the light rays coming in, let's say, and let's say it's a little tighter and, you know, the, the dancer or, the, or the, the actress or actor is off the screen and the camera's looking at the scene and it's, and it's changing its auto white balance to fit the scene, but then you have someone come in with a red shirt or, or just some other color or they're getting close to the camera the the auto white balance is going to say whoa we, we've just got a color shift here and it's going to change that white balance and you're not going to be able to fix that in post because it's going to constantly getting uh, magenta then green mm. and then blue you know it's better to have it all wrong like let's say you accidentally forgot to put it in uh, let's say you had it in tungsten uh the dial and you set up for the shot at least the whole scene won't be fluctuating and you can at least color grade it just one time for the whole scene so White balance is the most important thing. Yeah, like Nash said he shoots on one and tweaking the settings. I only use S-Log for really bright outdoors. See, the other thing too, which is a pain, like the log settings uh, that you use, you, you, then it gives you a minimum ISO, which is quite high. 800, this is yeah. another aspect as well. Yeah, 800 ISO for, for some of those yeah. uh, logs. And it's kind of like, oh, now you, now you need ND filters if you want any form of... Uh, uh, separation because you're gonna be shooting at f16 or whatever so yeah it's like like all that stuff for me being a minimalist is like no go and i've been shooting like this professional for professional uh commercials and everything and nobody's ever said oh, i don't know i don't think you shot you know log on that nobody knew i mean it's just yeah it's a, well, it's a waste of time for most he basically people. shoots raw now all the time so yeah uh, let's I mean, go on to the next story fair. all right so next one is talking about light uh, and we wanted to discuss this because um, I, I'll talk about my perspective um, first, and then we can um, I can give you, uh, you you can we'll show some examples about what we do. So funny thing is when well what I do whenever I look at a setting or a scene, it's like when brides, for instance, tell me to come out and look at the wedding venue and the locations we're going to shoot before the wedding day. And I always say, look, there's no point in me doing that because the light on the day might be completely different. And 
what it is is when I walk and look at something, I will always be looking around about how the light's falling and what type of light is hitting. And I think photographers, if you're a true photographer, you're always looking at light, always. And it's funny, we're a strange breed because we don't look at normal things. If I watch a video on TV or a cinema, I'm trying to think about how the lighting was done. And I bet you any money Langston would do that every single video that he sees. I'm always trying to look at how the lighting is created and how, you know, how they shoot within that context. So it's, it's really interesting and often people will laugh at me because I'll be driving somewhere and I'll go, oh, look at that light and I'll almost want to pull over and, yeah. you know, just sort of shoot it and we look at things a little bit differently. So I, I'm, I'm going to show a couple of images that I do and then Aaron will talk about it from his perspective. I'm going to show sort of outdoor settings and then Aaron is going to show some indoor settings, I think. But let me just show you what I'm talking about here. Um, let me open this up. Open in preview. All right, so we'll look at this one first. Let me share my screen. I'll just bring it over here so we can see what we're doing. Share screen. And let me go application window. And I wanted to use this one as a, as a perfect example about looking for the light. Now, there's light rays that are coming through this forest. And this is what I looked at when I... Um, when I went uh, looked for this image, I we tried decided to do a Red Riding Hood type shoot, okay. and I saw the light hitting, and you can see where the light's hitting down here. You can see where the beams are coming down, and the light's actually hitting through that section there. So I've asked her to stand directly in that light, and these are the things that you try to uh, find when you're looking at. Um, where to place uh, someone or something because uh, it's like this find the light and stand them in it I, I think is a perfect example of what you could yep. say so find the light stand them in it because it will make the most biggest difference in anything and i always look for these gaps between the trees where the the sunlight is starting to shine through and it, it will light them up and i did that in that dance video that i just posted uh before and I'll show you another image from that in a second so that's exactly how i've done that and you'll notice i've turned her face slightly towards the light as well it's, she's losing a bit of darkness on this side, but that's fine. It gives it a bit of mood. I don't mind that. I mean, I could have turned her around a lot more, but she's still being hit by that light that's coming out the side. Now, that's one example. So let me show you another one. Um, let me go to this one. Yeah, I'll have to share that. So let me just quit that for a second. Now this is uh, the other one, it's the same setting basically that you saw before. Um, now let me, did I open that up in preview? Yep. Let me go share screen, application window and this one. Now again, this is exactly the same thing. Um, there's light beams that are coming through the, the trees that I showed you in that video at the beginning that were coming down. And you can see the beams actually in effect coming through. But all I did was I asked her to again face towards that light. Uh, and Without that, this image would have been completely boring and lifeless. The thing that made this image is the light that's hitting Renee there. That that is the 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 total thing that's made this. And if you can do this, um, and you find that light that's there, and like I said, you stand that subject or whatever you're trying to do in that light that you're looking at it will make that much of a difference in your shot. Because really, at the end of the day, it's all about the light. That, that's the thing with this. Everything really is about the light that's hitting your subject because that's what gives that the pop and the brightness, the intensity. And, and even though this is very soft, uh, you know, without that light coming through and hitting Renee in the face, I deliberately asked Renee to point her face up towards that light because when she put it down, it wasn't hitting her in the right way. So asking her to sort of point that light up, her uh, face up towards that light there made all the difference uh, in this shot. So let me stop sharing because Aaron's going to now share some things with you as well. So Aaron, I think, is going to share some indoor stuff with you that you can have a look at. One thing I'll just say about outdoor just <clears throat> brought me to my attention is sometimes if you're walking outside and you let's say you're going down a, a street and there's trees and stuff like this, even though the sun might be, you know, over like the physical sun is over there, you might be like, oh, where's the sun, which I do like, where's the sun, but the sun's over there, but there's this big open spot in the trees where I can see the sky. So literally most of the light is kind of coming from this area. So it's not always like just the light source itself because it might be in shade and shadow, but 
if you just look around, you go like, this is like a bright hole here in the tree. So there's where my light is. So think about uh, light that way. Now, first I was gonna show just a real quick thing. Uh, how was we gonna do this? I need to go share screen, uh, app, uh, uh, entire screen. Let's see if I can do this right. Uh-oh. <laughs> is, it, is it not working? Why is it not working? Share. It's only letting me do application windows. So let me just show you this. Can you see the boot? Oh, that's come up. Yep. There we go. Okay. So stream. I'm just going to show you these real quick because he's showing, I'm going to show you model stuff too, okay. but it's all about chasing the light. So this isn't a model, but when I, you know, if I'm looking for a photograph, I'm fine trying to look for the light, finding out where the light is. And it, 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 I didn't set this up. I opened the door to take out the trash when I came back, like, oh my gosh, look. So it's just like trying to find the light. Now, I don't know if I can show another one and share. Forgive me if this is kind of wonky. Uh, can you see that photo of the, uh, of the light? Yep, let me wall? add it to your stream. Yep. Okay. So again, uh, you know, chasing the light, finding the light. So it's beautiful. You know, I want to go out and look for, oh yeah, the lines on here and stuff. And you know, without that light there, it would have been kind of, okay, cool. The lines look really interesting, all that, but the light just like, wow. So light is everything in a photograph, uh, or it could most of the time anyways, you can make, you can make photographs without light. Um, but let me show you like more of a model type stuff. Let me show you this one, uh, share screen application window. Oh, I, can I do, okay. I can do the Yeah, there thing. it is. Okay, so here's another oh, way. Um, actually, this that's is, not working because that's just showing your screen, your whole screen, I think, Aaron. You can't see my photo? Nope. Hmm. Let's go. You have to stop sharing yet. Yeah. Let's uh, <laughs> share screen, application window. Hey, wait a second. Sorry, guys, give me a second. That's all right. Why it doesn't there. work now. Okay, can you see that photo anyways? Yep. Okay, so this is in a barn. Now, there was horses in all these different stalls. Why didn't we choose the the horse in the middle of the barn? Well, naturally, because the light's not great. So we moved, like, where the camp, where you're seeing me take this photo, like, right behind me is the big open barn doors, not the ones at the, that you're, you can see the barn doors at the other end of this uh, barn, but right behind me is another big barn door where we opened wide, letting the light hit on our subjects here. And again, it's the light. If I wasn't skilled or I wasn't looking for light, I might have just picked a horse in the middle of the dark stall, and then we would have had a dark, gloomy photo. So I can show, um, let me show another one here. This one's interesting, I think. Uh, share screen, application window. So this one here is... All natural light. What did I do when we we're walking down the hallway? Well, I need to find the light. Where's the light coming from? Well, on to the right. Um, David will know this place that we yes, I certainly do. Yeah, yeah in Vegas, uh, in the uh, the Venetian, I believe. Um, as you're walking down this hallway, there's all these different windows. You can see the windows light hitting the floor as you walk down. So naturally, where's the light? It's right here. So I had my wife sit right here, and I'm using the light as a big soft light basically it's, and that and, window light there before you uh, quit it but yeah. I mean, the window light is usually and i'll use that with brides always it's always a gorgeous soft light which which is just so stunning to use and i think people it, often forget that that's one of the nicest lights that you, you know that you can get well yeah because for one it's big and i think when people are using bigger octaboxes with flash they're trying to mimic window light and being, being predominantly a natural light photographer, which I do use flash uh, quite a bit, but mostly natural, uh, I'd rather just go find this and all I had is a camera and a lens and boom, I'm done. Uh, so let me show you this one here. Now this is the exact, whoops, this, let me get out of that one. This is the exact same window, share screen, share application window. This is the exact same window. All I did was I we switched positions basically. I went on where she was standing and she went where I was standing because uh, I wanted to get those nice chandeliers. So uh, you know you don't you know, now now that I know where the light is now I can kind of you know walk around and find out how I want to use that light. And I will show one more here um, and this one here and then uh, we'll be done with this uh, share screen application window. 
uh, and share. So this one here, uh, this was for a magazine. I think I showed this before, but it's beautiful. Um, I had a 50 millimeter on, so I can only go mm -hmm. so far up the steps without having these lights over her face that are hanging here. And I wanted her to get close to the window light that you see to the left. Now I did use flash throughout this um, photo uh, session, but not on this one, because there's a window right there. So I had her walk up until she got in, into position where we don't see the window light, but those lights that were hanging there aren't in her face. And then it was a little more complicated because I had her look into the window, but it wasn't working because from this angle, it just didn't look good. Uh, it just looked weird. It was casting weird shadows and whatever. So I had her basically look away from the light, which you're told always to look into the light. But in this situation, by her looking away from the light, I said, that's not working. Can you put your hands on your back and maybe arch back? And as she arched back, this beautiful light, you know, mm. just grazed across her jawline and her face. And it completely worked, even though she's not looking into the light. So understand light. You don't always have to stare into it, but that's a good starting point. But if you can't, it's not working. Just have the model do some cool uh, pose. Like this wasn't a, a pose I had in my mind until we were there. And I said, let's and it, I think the pose actually turned out pretty good and the light worked. And so yeah, that's lovely. how I searched and for light. And you're right, Aaron, before you take that off, actually, yeah. too, it's it's often important, too, to, that they don't just face directly into the light because then you can get the shape that comes off. Remember, mm. light coming through a window, if you turn the uh, bride or model uh, sort of half off towards that, you'll get that gorgeous shape because you see the highlights and the shadows coming across the whole body, which is very slimming as well. Um, exactly. So it's important that, you know, you, you always look at light from the fact that it will slim someone as well, mm -hmm. uh, as well as being flattering and beautiful soft light as well. Yeah, and what we're, what we're there's two different lighting. There's broad lighting and narrow lighting, depending on what side of the, the, the face the shadow falls on. Uh, like this one here, the main light's hitting like the, the broad side of the face here. Uh, mm. And the, the smaller side of the face is basically in shadow. Now you can reverse that depending on the, the slimming effect or just the look you're going for. And for this model in this position, in this situation and composition, having her arch back, it just, it worked perfectly. So when I, okay, I can cancel that while I say my last thing here. So when you walk into a room or like David said, outside, you look, where's the light coming from? I need to know that. Uh, if you go into a room of a girl getting ready, let's say for makeup, where's the light coming from? Okay, they've got their little, oh, I didn't show it. They got their little ring light for the makeup, but yeah, it just doesn't look good because it looks better here. What I usually do is I'll close all the curtains and I'll turn off all the lights and then I'll create my own light either by opening the window up just a little bit if you want just like a slither of light coming through or if it's bouncing off the wall, creating a soft light or completely closing it and using a flash. So walk into a room or into the woods or into a street, like where's the light source? Once you know that, then you can start molding your photo and stuff like that. Okay, I'm done. That's fantastic. Jim said thumbs up, please. Yes, please. Thumbs up. Love it if you could support the channel. I noticed there's two haters out there that we've got. <laughs> Only two? You're good. You're, yeah, we're doing well. There's two good. haters. I love how they still watch the show, though. I love how they're still watching it and they give you a thumbs down. It cracks me up. Yeah, we um, all get that for some weird reason. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's that's talking about that. So what we're going to do now is just go to the last story, which is talking about Apple. We won't be on this much, but I just wanted to discuss it because it's talking about the Apple is ditching the Intel Mini. Actually, before we do do that. I need to bring that up as a page. Um, new window. I'm writing down the time. What time is it? Uh, I put 59. Uh oh, it's not working. Let me just bring this up. And I'll see if I can find the story. Because basically, it's talking about oh, yeah, um, the new processor that uh, Apple, Apple, that Apple is going to use. Um, let me just see if I can find the story through here. While you're looking, yeah, Apple's not going to use the uh, the Intel chip anymore, which is pretty exciting, actually. Not for Intel. I know. I know. It's, Intel, it's going to be amazing. All right, so I've got the story up. Let me just share this. Yeah, go for it. Once it comes up on the screen. Why is my computer going? The internet's just gone slow. Yeah, so anyway, why this is trying to load up. Uh, it's interesting because Apple had their WWDC or whatever it was called the other day, and they've now said that they're going to produce an Apple um, processor. They're going to they're gonna use one of the ARM chips uh, mm -hmm. instead of uh, using Intel chips. Now, this is going to be a massive thing if you're dealing with um, 
Apple uh, particularly, and you like things like Aaron uses his iPad, for instance, all the time. Now, is that opening up or it's not? Um, Apple is using his iPad all the time. Uh, Apple is using, using his iPad. Room, things like that. Okay, it's just opened up. So let me just share this just for a second. Uh, share screen, application window. This I'm one. all iPad now, even on my videos. All right, so this is um, just the story about it, and, and it's just a whole discussion about – uh, what they're doing. And, you know, they've gone from PowerPC, which used to be the early one, then they shifted over yeah. to Intel. Um, and now they're going to shift away from Intel and go towards um, their ARM processor. And they did this whole demo of showing how it performed. Uh, and this is with a, a lower end one, which is probably the same, almost the same processor that's in the iPad actually at the moment. They mm -hmm. did some incredible Photoshop stuff that you can see here with the number of layers uh, that are, are sort of in this image. And also it was showing some Final Cut stuff that was running 4K footage uh, as well. Um, and it worked in real time, like, like it was incredible. I don't yeah. think people understand how powerful that the iPad is uh, safe even now. Like Aaron's now doing all his video editing on the iPad. Um, and the, the thing is, I can just imagine where these processes are going to go in, in the you know next couple of years. So they've said by yeah, the end great. of the year, they're going to bring out the first one. And it looks like it might be something like an iPad mini with the, the uh, might be an updated um, 2020 uh, iPad Pro um, chip in it. Now, why this, though, is important, like a lot of you may be saying, well, this is no big deal, but but it is. It's a massive big deal because what this does is it means all of the Apple software has to be rewritten, and that, that's not a big task because apparently from what Apple have said, uh, the software that they've developed to do this can do it within a matter of days. Now, they showed Adobe were already uh, supporting it with Photoshop and Lightroom. They showed that already working. And like I said, I just showed you that in that web page that I'll share down below anyway. But it worked incredibly efficiently, like, like amazingly yeah. well. Now, the incredible thing about this, though, is that once they transition over to the ARM processor, it means that you will now be able to run the same programs on the iPad as well as the uh, desktop and vice versa. So it means, for instance, if you're on an iPad, you'll be able to run Final Cut. You'll be able to run all of these programs uh, that you couldn't run before on an iPad. And it will also mean that they're going to develop much, much better apps. Like I said, you'll be able to run the full Photoshop on, on an iPad. And this is incredible. I mean, I can't wait for this to happen. Like, it, it really excites me uh, with what's going to happen. And after watching that um, WWDC and when they showed this working live and how powerful it was with the current chips that are out there, I'm just thinking, boy, you know, what are they going to be able to do uh, in another one or two years' time? I mean, I, I think it's very exciting, Aaron. What do you think about this? Well, yeah, you know me having problems with my computer, hard drives and all that stuff. And I, I only use my computer now for uh, doing these live shows. Um, if I have some heavy editing, which I never do anymore, uh, I'll use it. But typically, like my, my newest YouTube video that I keep talking about in this show, it all done on here in an X-T2. I mean, it was just so easy. Um, the X-T2 allows me to even transfer it wirelessly, so I don't even need anything. It just goes here. Uh, LumaFusion is what I use. It works great. Layers and all the music, uh, everything you see in that video is done on here. So I can't imagine, you know, having this processing uh, type power, which is going to be bring other, well, Adobe's, you know, already bringing stuff over. But if they could bring like After Effects over type of stuff or even 3D programs. I, you were scrolling through there, David, and I saw like a, oh, yeah, Maya. They, yeah, Maya. I, I, yeah. yeah, I have to read that a little more. But Maya, mm -hmm. that's a 3D program like Cinema uh, Cinema 4D and um, uh, Max. I forget what it's called now. They were showing and, layers and everything, oh, Aaron. Man. It was incredible. It's, like, no, that's, that's going to bring an iPad. I mean, this is the future right here. I mean, it, I think this is already the future. But once they do that, I mean, there's like just no need for a computer, I don't think, for so many things. Hook this up to a monitor if you want even a bigger monitor. Maybe even have a smaller iPad like this. Uh, this is an Air 2, uh, just so for, for portability, and then hook it up to your monitor with all the power that these have. I mean, it's Well, it's that's exciting. what Brett's saying. Brett's saying iPads and tablets are too small for me for editing stills of video, but but they're not, Brett, because no, you I, put it on I, this use, thing. I use a, a tablet. Now, you can use it as a tablet, and it connects as, it can, can connect to multiple 4K monitors. Like These yeah, things like, are unbelievable how much power they can actually run. So yeah, I, I think, oh, Brett, you've, you've sort of got to see it from a different way because they, they're 
incredibly powerful when you join them up to uh, these 4K or even any other monitors. They work very, very well. Um, that was someone at the door. <laughs> it might be a delivery. Aaron, do you want to keep Go talking for, for a second? He's getting another gimbal, guys. Go get that gimbal, kiddo. <laughs> going to go get another gimbal. Oh, I was going to type to you, Langston. Uh, yeah, like I said, you know, if I'm doing some high-end stuff, yeah, I can't do it on the iPad. But the majority of the stuff that I've been doing the last several years, uh, even just like editing commercials and stuff, I mean, I've done a lot on this. Uh, client doesn't know. They don't need to know. And do they care? No. So, but high-end stuff, yeah. You know what? Some of my uh, graphics I was doing uh, on my other YouTube channel, I would have to use this. But Man, you could put together very beautiful artistic pieces uh, that doesn't require heavy editing and all that stuff. Personal type stuff. Like I said, even commercials that are simple, film film the thing and just simple edits and graphics that, that maybe you already have or uh, title layovers and stuff like that. So indeed, indeed. What else have we got here while uh, our friend, I can hear David. <laughs> He's getting another gimbal. What we got here? Uh, Another gimbal, yes. Hashtag another gimbal. Jim Penn, uh, uh, someone's talking to you, Jim. Yeah, transcoding stuff, oh yeah. I was looking for years to find like a way to transcode uh, to different formats on here, but uh, I've never really, they don't, not that I know, they don't have anything and how would it work? I'm not sure. Uh, I was transcoding everything to uh, Apple uh, ProRes which I would use my this big computer for. You guys can't see it, but it's this Goliath down here. Uh, what else we got? Uh, the software I got on here as far as editing video is um, LumaFusion. And then uh, for my photography that I've been doing on this for about six years now is uh, Affinity Photo. And that's kind of like my my heavy heavy lifter when it comes to a lot of uh, editing stuff, uh, but like Lightroom stuff like that is on here. Oh, so is it a gimbal? <laughs> it's just the A7S3. Ah, uh, let's change that. You know what it is? <laughs> it's <laughs> driving me. It is driving me nuts, Aaron. I've got this thing called a pessimist tree right out the front, and it's really unusual. Like they have, it looks they look like tomatoes, but they're orange. But the Italians and Greeks love them. And every single day they come knocking on the door asking if I can have some. It, it is nuts. Is that a joke? No, I'm serious. They, they, they're like obsessed with this tree. It looks like a Christmas tree because it has no leaves left on it, but all you see is the fruit that's on it. Oh, and so they're, they're bright orange. Uh, they're this really weird looking fruit. They're called pessimans. But they, I'm not joking, I would get two, three people every single day knocking on the door trying to get them. But I'm, but what they're doing is they're buying them because they're expensive. They're about $3 a, a fruit. And oh, they, wow. they want to buy them and then sell them in the markets. So now I'm selling them for $20, uh, for $10 a bag. I, I pick a few, put them in a bag, and I'll get $10 and oh, I'll give them to the grandkids. Cute. That's funny. Okay, <laughs> I got homework for you. You have to go get a photo of this tree because I'm very interested. It's uh, really Get some freaky. cool artistic shot of that thing. I want to see it. I, yeah, I've never heard of it. People come in the garden and they take photos of it because it looks like a Christmas wow. tree. It's, it's bizarre, yeah. Um, so, yeah, did you answer Mark's saying what uh, software did you use? Did you? Cause yeah, I think what, so. Yeah. He didn't. Oh, a video and photo. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. All right, so that's good. So, anyway, just to sort of finish on that, I, I'm really excited about this. I can't wait. In fact, I was yeah. thinking about updating my computer uh, re fairly soon because Kerry's, uh, I, she's got a Mac Pro, is getting fairly old. So we were thinking about eventually replacing that, but now I think I'm going to wait because I don't want to yeah. uh, get anything at the moment because I think if you buy an Intel Mac, uh, knowing Apple, they're liable to stop yeah. supporting that in two okay, years' bye. time. Bye-bye. So I'm going to wait, and um, I'm seriously now thinking of oh, the next one we get will be one of the ARM ones. Uh, I can't wait. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I would definitely right. wait too. I, I would. I mean, this this is like the older, I don't know what this is, 2018 or something i can't remember now 2017 maybe uh and what's the new one you know this is the old uh, i don't know the terminology yeah, there's a usb c one that you've got now that's what i've got yeah yeah i so the next ones though i think you know this should last me at least another two years we'll see what yeah. happens in this new transformation that they're doing with these processors 
I mean, it's they are incredibly powerful. Like I can run 4K footage on my iPad without it. It doesn't even skip a beat. No, uh, either it, with this. Yeah, Luma it, it's, I have two yeah, tracks. <laughs> yep, it's incredible. 4K tracks. And like when you watch that, uh, when they showed that stuff working from an iPad Mini, that what it yeah. was doing in in Final Cut. Uh, yeah. Maya and also um, Lightroom, everything with multiple, you know, different layers and stuff. It's incredible. You think of that because the thing is they're all integrated. It's not like when you have Intel, which nothing really works together. The Apple stuff yeah. is all integrated, all works together. And so they I don't need as much sort of powerful stuff like they do on the PC side. And, and that's why Apple have always been so good with Final Cut and, you know, and, and all these other programs. Okay, Aaron, did you want to show your uh, image or do you want me yeah, to show it first? Uh, I'll show it because it's up right here. Uh, okay. You know, we're kind of uh, share screen uh, application. I don't know why I can't do the full thing, but there it is. So, you know, going back on this whole lighting uh, situation, I might have showed this before, uh, but, you know, it's one of those uh, looking for the light type of shots again. So I thought it's I beautiful. would show this. What we did here was this was a magazine shoot. Well, we were in a doing a magazine shoot. I wasn't the main photographer two weeks ago in this place you're looking. But while we were there... Uh, being, you know, part of the shoot, uh, do, I was doing the jewelry side of this thing. And uh, we saw this and my wife was going to be featured in a magazine. Uh, so when we looked at this place, we said, oh, let's come back and do your magazine shoot here. So while we were there uh, for the other magazine shoot, I was looking for the light. I was saying, what time of day is it? Uh, where's the light coming from? I love this, uh, this bookshelf that we were at. So even though I was shooting, uh, you know, I wasn't the main photographer. I was still looking for light. Like David says, we're always looking for light. So as I saw this window off here to the to the right of the photograph, I was like, oh, my gosh, we're now the furniture wasn't here. So we had to move the furniture, which got to be careful. You should ask before you move furniture around. Uh, but it was one chair facing the complete opposite way, kind of on the other side here. And I told my wife, hey, let's come back at this time because the lighting, the light coming through that window is absolutely beautiful. And all we have to move, do is move this chair into position and we got it. And I knew, uh, I think this was done with a 50 millimeter. And so, yeah, chasing the light, looking at it. So we already planned it. We went there next week. Uh, it, it didn't even matter if it, it was raining outside or anything because this time of day, you know, you're just going to have beautiful light coming in regardless. You might just have to use a slower shutter or a higher ISO to get, you know, the illumination you want. And that's what we did. And we set her up and she looked into the light with a little bit of tilt on her head because the shadows weren't the way the wind, the way the window was on this door was a little higher up. I think you might be able to see. Oh, wait, can you see? Uh, you can see how the window light was a little higher, yeah. you know, a little higher there. So just by having her tilt her head a little bit, you know, just made the light, the, the shadows fall how I wanted them and didn't look too weird. And that's how we did it, chasing the light. And that's behind the photo. Okay, David. Uh, let me show mine. Did they, could they hear me? Maybe they couldn't even hear me. Yeah. Because I saw a button saying, do you want to share your audio? No? No, well, I think they could. Uh, oh, because I just know in the chat. The no one's saying, not... no one's huh. saying they couldn't hear you, though. Let us know in the know chat, guys, whether button. they could hear you. Uh, let me just share this one. Uh, this was a shot that I took the other day. The Otways down, uh, well, not that far from me, really, is is one of the most beautiful places, I think, on Earth. Oh, I, I love the Otways. Uh, yeah. This was the photo where I stood um, the dancer, Renee, but this was shot with the um, A9. Uh, I decided to just do a... Um, uh, a shot of it. Uh, I, I, the funny thing was when we got out the car, I, it was sort of, we just drove past it, didn't notice, but then I just saw a fraction of light and I thought, I wonder if there's any beams, because we took smoke uh, to do with it on the day. I thought I was going to have to use smoke to get lift up into the trees and, you know, make that sort of light beams, but it was natural. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. <laughs> and, and, you know, people said they heard you, Aaron, so you're fine. Um, so the thing was, I looked around the corner and I said to Kerry, oh my God, Kerry, come and grab your iPhone. She took a great couple of iPhone ones. I put one on Facebook this morning, uh, one of the 3D ones as well. Um, it looked even fantastic with the, the iPhone. But, you know, th this was just beautiful. It was one of those moments where you take, you, you just look at it, you look at it in awe 
of nature and just think, oh, my God. And I grabbed an image of it, and I'm so happy with how it was. Uh, it came out. Now, it was way underexposed, though, because I had to underexpose it to keep the um, the light beams from blowing out the highlights. So I did way underexpose this, and this is one advantage about having the dynamic range yeah. that you've got now in the sensors because then I brought the exposure back up in the shadows um, with very little editing on this, actually. So, you know, and I, I just adore this shot. might be one that I end up getting blown up and put on the wall, but it's just one of those times where you're in the right place at the right moment, and this is why I always say you always have to be looking for the light and I thought it was a perfect one to sort of um, uh, to show so let me stop sharing that you know that's one thing I know some photographers that they'll they'll my wife is like this she'll see something boom photo you know mm. I'll see something like, wow look at that you know oh my god this is just the best thing I've ever oh my my phone <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, I'm like a photographer and it takes me so long to sometimes if I'm not out, you know, like, oh, let's, you know, I'm in hand, let's look for a photo. And I'm just walking or whatever. She'll see something and take photo of it. Oh, that's true. Let me get my bag. And yeah, I'm terrible at doing that. So that's a, that was a good opportunity to get a photo of that, man. Yeah, Brett just asked how I like the Rode PubMark. I like it. I mean, I'm, I really like it. I think it it's great absolutely for the price. Amazing. Yeah, and it's a good Aussie company. Um, so it's good to support the uh, local companies. Oh, so. you know what? To, speaking about them, uh, the the road video goes whatever this thing is i'm yep. using uh you know they had like a kind of a defect on their little dead cat oh, did you get the thing. new ones yeah and it, and it came into uh where my wife works it says uh from australia like australia she just thought that was kind of funny <laughs> and i forgot that they are their companies from there so yeah they're, they're from the uh, good old land of aussies yeah Cool. So uh, anything before we finish, um, Brett just said he loves his as well. Um, that's good, Brett. Yeah, I think it's a great uh, product for the price that particularly. What have you got coming up, Aaron? Anything exciting the next week? Well, if you guys want to head on over to my uh, my new YouTube channel for, for new people. You don't know what that is. Uh, for you old people, go to my uh, new one, Aaron Janderson Photographer. I think David will probably put it in the yeah, link. Yeah, put the link below, yep. In the description. And what I'm doing is just, uh, it's going to be all about the art of photography. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, shooting for numbers or subscribers. I mean, it's great when people come over and they like you and they like your work. I love that and cherish every one of you, uh, but it's not like I'm not going to be throwing stuff together. So my videos might take a little while to get out because I don't want to rush them. And I just want to really research what I'm talking about uh, and really just make great artistic -y type uh, art of uh, videos about the art and history of uh, photography. Beautiful. I've got the Tamron review coming up, the full review. I know I put the video review up uh, of it doing uh, filming a video of, of Renee the dancer, uh, but I'll have the full review up um, probably tomorrow, I think, because um, I've, I've been taking stacks of stuff and things like that, so I could give can you a, give a, us a, a really a good quick, review. Can you give us a little quick... Uh, little tidbit did do you like it or you don't yeah or no i do I, th I think it's probably the best uh travel lens for sony that's available um Ooh. so i tested it against a 70 to 200 and it matches that like the f4 version and that's way yeah i saw more those expensive. photos you yeah, do like, it on the eye and yeah. stuff yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it matches. Great. The focus is amazing. The the range that you get with it is amazing. It's light. It's small. It, it, it's got everything going for it. And, in fact, probably when I do my next big trip, it'll probably be a lens that I'll buy. It, it is that good. Um, so, yeah, so that's probably what I'll have up uh, in the um, coming days. So, uh, apart from that, uh, wanna, thank you Mark, so much. Mark said something, uh, let your video simmer as per Michael Jackson. It's so funny you say that, Mark, because <laughs> – no, because this is so funny is uh, before Michael died, his last, um, I forget what it was called, his last big show type thing, uh, they did a movie about it, him behind the scenes and stuff. And one of the things he said was just that is when, when you hear the beat to the music, just let it simmer there, let the audience kind of want more and feel it and then come in with the next beat. And it's so funny because I've never heard anybody else uh, say that except for Mark and my wife and because we saw the same thing. So that's exactly right. He was a genius. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> no worries. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I'll be back uh, probably, well, should be back by Friday for the latest rumors because it looks like Sony have delayed the A7S three again. Hang on, hang on a second. Which one is it? <laughs> I was wondering, like, what are you doing? Oh, okay, I forgot about that. You're going to need that button a lot with Sony, man. Oh, lately, right? <laughs>
So oh, I should be back with, on Friday with the Sony Alpha News and Rumors. <laughs> Apart from that, we'll be back next week. This is more uh, like how I want this show to go with, with Aaron. It's more talking about the art, uh, you know, how we do shooting, yeah. all this sort of stuff. This is this is definitely the direction that we wanted to go uh, with this show. So I'm so happy with how it's turning out. If you yeah. haven't subscribed to Aaron, please do. Uh, like I said, I'll put the link uh, down below so you can subscribe to him as well. Thank apart you, from you. that, everyone, it was good to see Jim back as well. So welcome yes, back, Jim. Jim. It's great to see you back here. Uh, apart from that, everyone, we'll see you all in the next video. Thanks, guys. Catch you later. Bye for Bye. now. Really good. <laughs>